Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining this conference call. I'm Stefano Bestetti. I'm Head of Marketing of uh, Edge Invest. I'm in Milan uh, with Alessandra Manuli, CEO of uh, Edge Invest. Uh, we are waiting for the beginning of the conference call with Filippo Lanza, Manager of Edge Invest Numen Credit Fund. Filippo will command the portfolio in the light of Mario Draghi decisions. So, Thank you, Filippo, for a conference call uh, the day after the ECB meeting. So you can start if you, if you want. Uh, are you online? Yes, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining the call. Um, we can start uh, now. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here, and uh, thanks to all the investors that have been uh, placing faith with us. Um, we're pleased about the performance we had until now. And I want to just comment on that um, for the ones that have the slides in, for the presentation in front of you. Um, just looking at page two, I would like to um, uh, emphasize how uh, quickly and how strong the uh, fund has been growing, uh, partially thanks to the performance and partially thanks to the uh, interest that we've been uh, uh, finding from the investor, especially in Europe, um, initially from Italy and then now extending to the rest of Europe. Um, currently, um, the UCIS fund is, uh, is going past the 500 million mark in dollar terms. Uh, we're having a decent performance until now. We're probably going past the 5%. This month is a pretty good uh, pretty good start as well, although it's quite early in the month, but we, 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 had a, we placed a few calls into the ECB meeting, which are sort of coming through, um, as some of you that have been following us know. Um, there's a quick update in terms of the business. Also, we are pleased to, to, to inform you that we have uh, been upgrading the business on many different fronts, uh, both in terms of operational, on the operational side, financial side, and also in terms of uh, our research analyst capability. Um, currently, um, John O'Shorka just uh, been hired as a new CEO, CFO, um, helping us uh, to deal especially with the new uh, increasing amount of regulatory uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and legislative changes coming through the market. And we're also in, in the process of hopefully adding another two or three people on the senior analyst side and potentially another two or three junior guys um, over the summer. So that hopefully would help uh, improve our intelligence around the market and our idea generation. Um, going forward, I'll just comment briefly on page three and page four of the presentations. Those um, highlight our uh, the performance of the fund um, towards the um, average comparable fund and also what I would define as a relatively close benchmark uh, for what we do, which is European IG index. Uh, you've seen the performance being very strong. Um, I think this month we're not, uh, what, until now, month to date, we're not um, uh, disappointing that sort of expectation, so we, we, we're going on pretty strong. Um, the page four as well is trying to give you a more granular um, comparison in terms of what we do compared to other funds. It's always very difficult to, to kind of box us uh, given our focus on what we define the new credits, uh, which specifically for Europe are uh, macro credits, as in uh, sovereign uh, issuance, whether it is Germany, Italy, or even Greece and Cyprus. And at the same time, um, a lot of, of our focus on the financial institution. And, another, and uh, last but not least, on what I would say is traditional credit, always with an event uh, and catalyst uh, focus and angle. We provided this slide because I think it may help and assist investors in their asset allocation when it comes down to understanding how the Hedge Invest Newman uh, Fund could fit within their portfolio. Um, now moving to the uh, to probably one or the, the most interesting part I think for all of us, which is uh, what is the expectation in terms of the market and how we are positioned in the book. Um, in, in the best of our knowledge and expectation right now. Well, first of all, I think we need to um, comment on what happened yesterday from the ECB, uh, which I know is, is, a, is, is a major uh, focus for a lot of our investors. Um, I would say two things. Uh, first, um, very importantly, I think uh, Mario Draghi managed uh, to uh, help the ECB in its entirety, because it was a unanimous decision, to move past the Rubicon. So uh, to use a historical analogy, they gone 
beyond the level from which it's very difficult to return. So, and I think that's very, very important. Um, I think it's, for us it's more important as a market perception than reality because we think ECB has already passed the Rubicon many times with the provision of ELA, uh, which probably some of the, the, the long-standing investors among you have been bored to death hearing. Um, but that's important in terms of market perception, how the market understands and believes uh, that the ECB is truly committed and in a unanimous way to kind of avoid any sort of, let's call it weak inflation outlook or de anchor of inflation expectation or, or deflation for that matter. So that's one first very important point. Uh, the second point I would add there is that as we have seen uh, many times when it comes down to Europe and ECB, um, there is a very lagged effect because there is a very, um, I would say, lag understanding given the complexities and intricacies of both the euro construct overall and then specifically the way the policy is articulated. Um, what I'm trying to say with that is that as we've seen with the summer of 12 when there was that famous statement with whatever it takes and then secondly with the LTRO and so on, We've seen many times there's been um, a relatively mooted reaction, right? Uh, but then a very important market move after that. Um, and, and I'm saying that because uh, we have a sense, and we build that that that, that sense over time that uh, DCB is not necessarily misunderstood, but I think the the, the full impact of their operation is sometimes. Um, uh, understated by the market, and only over time they really understand. Now, that gap has been closing because, of course, Mario Draghi and ECB has, have built a lot in terms of credibility and, and track record, but at the same time, we still think there is a gap. So overall, and, and going into the specifics, I think the way we look at the, the new uh, decision, I think that the, the cutting of the interest rate, again, is more for market perception. It's more, it's more for uh, market consumption to make sure everybody is now fully confident the ECB is committed. I think what is more interesting there is that Mario Draghi yesterday clearly said that, that, that for all the practical purposes they reached the lower bound, which people may view it as, oh, are they already stopping, but it actually should be viewed exactly as the opposite because they already exhausted the interest rate uh, policy framework, which, if you want, is the traditional policy tool. It means they are ready to do whatever else is left, and there is plenty uh, of options left which is what the market commentators usually refer to quantitative easing. Now, going into that, what they are doing is effectively already some sort of quantitative easing. Now, it's difficult to quantify, and again, apologies, because we, we want to do one side update immediately after this, but at the same time, we, we, we need to be cognizant that uh, we, we're still digesting all the news. We're still trying to understand exactly the, the details, and there are a few details that are still missing from ECB, which will be published later on. Um, but... In terms of quantity easing, uh, we estimate anywhere between a 250 all the way up to possibly 750 billion cash injection into the system over the next six to 12 months. So quite substantial. Uh, specifically with respect to the TLTRO, it's probably the most misunderstood piece. Um, our understanding is effectively this is a, a sort of unconditional LTRO for the first two years, which means basically they can buy anything they like with that. And then after that, there is no penalty, but basically it can be extended if there is truly uh, a new net lending activity. Now, there's still plenty of discretionary items in there, which shouldn't surprise anybody because the ECB loves to keep discretion. discretion. They are central banks at the end of the day, so the, the main driver of all of this is the benchmark, what they call the benchmark in terms of corporate lending. Now, that's pretty pretty much undefined, I would say, as of now. So that, that's something else they will keep as, as a... Um, as an item to potentially steer the policy one way or another. Uh, but that's quite big. Uh, it will, the real cash will start f uh, filtering through probably September and December this year, and maybe most of it in September already. We'll, we'll find out. Our expectation will be a very high uh, intake of that TLTRO because it's effectively unconditional with no penalties attached um, and is incredibly cheap. Uh, so we think that whatever the market was thinking, oh, this is only for corporate loans, it's not for the, whatever the, what Sarkozy uh, suggests to be the carry trade on government bonds with the regional LTRO, that is wrong. Because our understanding is that this thing can be used for whatever the banks like. 
Uh, and then again, we view these as potentially more impactful than the QE in US, which doesn't mean it's going to produce more results because I think there is a global issue which is growth, which which we can uh, touch upon later. But uh, all, all said, the, the view on Europe is that I think we are in a position where we should expect more outperformance. We should expect more outperformance. We've been calling for for the last six nine months. I think there's still going to be this. This thing has got a big push, a big push. Uh, and I think it is, the good thing is actually not coming in one shot, but it's probably going to build up over time. Uh, so I think we're going to see more spread compression, uh, although across Govi, although you need to be very careful about the anchoring leg, which is the bund, which is a function also of what is the growth picture, what is the U.S. policy on rates, so that, that's something to keep in mind. And overall, for both uh, for credit, I think it's relatively uh, positive, actually say very positive, uh, probably more for bank credit, because banks are the direct beneficiaries of all of these. Uh, and some of, we already seen some of the new earnings revision, but could be anywhere between 5 to 5, 10 15%. And corporate as well, but let's not forget that corporate now are effectively being incentivized from the ECB indirectly through the banking system to unleash their animal spirits. So corporates will be a little bit more aggressive. We'll speak more about that. Uh, banks are going to be very good, but uh, it's very good for the banks. At the same time, one view that we always held for the last uh, few years is that, and specifically now into the AQR stress test, is the more the ECB is generous in terms of cash injection, and balance sheet expansion, they own balance sheet expansion, the more likely it is they will be demanding when it comes down to balance sheet restructuring of banks. So it's a bit of dull death. They'll give you more money on one side, but on the other side, they will want to make sure banks are issuing more equity. Uh, the example of Monte de Paschi is, is a classic. We've been talking about it probably since, since we started the fund, and, uh, and every time we came to Milan for the big uh, investors meetings, um, the big presentation, but uh, Pasqui last year, remember, at the beginning of the year, they didn't even think they needed any cash, then they moved to $1 billion, then the capital increase became $3 billion, and now they are doing a $5 billion issuance. And I think that could be something that we see a little bit more, but that we'll look at that. Uh, going down to UK, so European assets definitely expect outperformance. Um, on UK, we are quite cautious and quite negative because I think UK, of all the countries, is the one which is more far ahead in terms of quantitative easing. So especially when it comes down to government, uh, corporate and equity, we are relatively neutral. But I think when it comes down to government, uh, and again, those are views which are, as you know, we're very humble and we always try to, we will always change our mind if the data or if the news or if the market reaction is different from what we expect. Uh, we will adapt our view. We don't. Uh, attached to it in an, on any sentimental basis. But on UK at the moment, we are a bit worried because it may be the first country where we, if we do have growth, we may have the room for a policy mistake, as in we may see some inflation, no massive growth, and at the same time finding the central bank a little bit behind. There will be a positive scenario because it means there's enough growth and inflation, but at the same time it could create volatility. I think in U.S., similar to U.K., the biggest risk we see is room for policy mistakes, um, either because they they go on with the with with the tapering, um, they keep on doing tapering, but um, the economy actually is not really there, and then we'll find out that after the summer the economy is not strong, and there will be big big problem. Um, at the same time, if if the economy is doing well, I think rates will probably normalize here. But if we look at that and if we look at corporate and equity, we think they're both pretty expensive. Uh, so we have short position there. Um, corporate specifically, I think, again, as for Europe, we'll be seeing a lot of event activity coming up. Um, Japan, similarly, uh, I think we've been in a situation where Japan is following uh, is very quickly closing the gap between Japan and UK in terms of being the one most far advanced in terms of aggressiveness of balance sheet expansion. So there, again, we have no crystal ball. We don't pretend to have it, to have one, but we're also pretty confident that nobody has a crystal ball. But on there, I think, again, we need to follow the data and see what happens, but um, th there is a lot of things which are quite uh, quite uh, worrying. In terms of the credit, there's nothing to be doing there. I don't think there's any value uh, because of the fixed income uh, um, opportunity there, and if anything, Japan for us it will be a short in fixed income as a cheap short against potential policy mistake and or uh, potential growth pickup globally. Uh, on the equity side, I think there is a good potential, but at the same time, we recognize the consensus trade, and so far consensus trades have been a bit of the uh, we would define them widow makers so far, so we'll be careful. Uh, emerging markets, we think are overall across pretty overvalued, uh, both in 
government bonds, valuation and equity. I think credit, corporate and banks, they are selected good opportunities. Uh, but the biggest worry we see with emerging markets is that if we have no growth, we'll be in a scenario where we'll enter into competitive devaluations. Um, the so-called, uh, let's look at the ECB action, what they've done now is pretty impressive um, and is to save their own eurozone. So it will be a lot of those actions in conflict with one each other. So we'll have Japan, UK, Europe, US all trying to achieve the same results by using the same tool, which is monetary expansion. Monetary expansion eventually will create currency devaluation uh, on a competitive basis and within the least uh, prepared uh, economies to manage that sort of shock are emerging market. And also we see a, a, um, a continuing trend of, of social and political instability. We've seen it with the Arab Spring and all the countries who are supposed to be uh, rock solid, whether it was Libya, Egypt, Syria now. Um, unfortunately, the next countries that could be in that trend are Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Russia, potentially China. So on that, we, we think if there is growth, fantastic, but then is a call on growth because valuations are very, very stretched. Um, if there is no growth, then we have a real issue because I think the next stage of the, the big debt deleverage that started in 08 or 09, the next stage of that, if we have no growth, the biggest loser will be by far, in our view, emerging market. So on that, we keep on having short position. Uh, did we lose money on that? Absolutely, yes. Um, are they negative carry? Yes. Um, are we going to keep them? Absolutely, yes. Um, because, again, we have no crystal ball, but if we look at the risk-reward here, we definitely want to be positioned in a situation where there is no growth. Uh, we want to have upside from there, because the, the opposite of having good growth will be a very manageable uh, issue for the fund, for the business, for anyone. Um, so that, that, that's a picture. And the other thing, as you know, we always had... Uh, uh, we've always been placing an enormous amount of faith on the ECB. Uh, we think, based on our macro approach, macro credit approach, if you look at the management team of the ECB, it's far superior to any other central banks now. So if they have decided, no matter what, all the like historical resistance and the political resistance, to still engage into an aggressive balance sheet expansion, even after they already expanded the balance sheet aggressively, and probably more than what the market thinks, now if the ECB has decided to do that, that is probably a bad signal for growth. Again, we have no crystal ball, but if we need to bet, we we'll probably think the ECB has got a better crystal ball than us and the market. So if I look at that, that's actually quite scary in terms of the growth outlook, which, again, is good overall for fixed income, good for credit, and potentially could be quite negative for equity. Uh, but then again, uh, we, have, uh, and I, we keep on saying we have no crystal ball. We don't think we can predict the market better than anyone else. But so, we'll be, we'll, but so we are positioning around themes and situations where the risk-reward is skewed to our favor, and that's how we're building the portfolio on the sort of macro credit side. Um, I'm then moving to, uh, to the next slide, which is uh, going through the, the probably is describing the way we would uh, we would probably employ I would say almost up to two thirds of the of the of the portfolio. Uh, the big opportunity we see now in Europe, especially with this renewed stability on the macro side, is that that is even making even more likely um, to see big events. And by big events, I mean big balance sheet restructuring, corporate action, M&A activity, and so on and so forth. Now, the best sector, which is what we've been focusing for the last six years, um, is banks. Banks have a very predictable calendar of events, which is due to the AQR stress test. Now we have, on a, to add to that calendar of events, we have all these TL, TRO, and additional monetary uh, activity from the ECB. Um, there is plenty of stuff there. And the value, um, and we think, as, as I said already, the value migration is going to happen from equity all the way to corporate. At the end of the day, if you look at the equity as a call option on assets, banks' volatility in terms of assets is going down because of regulatory constraint. Equity is going up in terms of supply. And so the value of credit, of credit being short of put on those banking assets, especially now with the new liquidity and everything else, is, is substantially going down. So that's a very positive environment. It's probably even better than what we thought before the ECB, a lot better now. And at the same time, I follow, we are consistent with our view, which is if the ECB is generous on the monetary policy side, then they will be demanding on the other side. Because if they are convinced there is no macro risk, there is no liquidity risk, and the market is good, they will push the banks to get as much as they can get away with 
So expect more issuance of 81, expect more issuance of equity, more issue of equity hybrid. There will be plenty. So from that point of view, we are, we are less – we're not aggressively bearish on equity, but as a relative value, definitely prefer credit to equity, and I think there will be plenty of opportunity in terms of relative value, capital structure, restructuring of liabilities. One big theme which we're very, very keen on is that AQR stress test is just one – big driver of events, and they will be eventually done by the end of the third quarter, so October, November, uh, sorry, the yeah, end of October, sorry, the end of October. Um, now, after that, we do expect an enormous amount of m and transactions for two reasons. Number one, the ECB will know everything about every bank in Europe. They will know much more than any domestic authority ever knew about their own banks. They'll have all the details, all the numbers, all the loans, everything. So they will become like a speed dating service. They'll go through and find the best combination among banks, and they'll do it. Why are they going to do it? For two reasons. One, the, the bigger the banks, the more stable. Everybody loves to say they had too big to fail, but at the same time, from a regulatory point of view, yeah, that, that's a natural inclination. But secondly, which is even more interesting, is that if you hear the ECB statements for the last six, seven years, right, the major concern is their inability to transmit monetary policy stimulus via the banking system. And one of the main reasons of that is that the banking system is highly fragmented, and that fragmentation has only gone up. It stopped increasing, but it's, still, but it's gone up to levels which are unprecedented to before, probably to even before the Eurozone. So that is one thing that they definitely need to address. Now, they've done the LTRO, the TLTRO, the LA, all the rest, but the best way to create, uh, to remove fragmentation is to create the real global European players. So we expect a lot more. Now, again, I'm looking at Pasqui because uh, Pasqui, is the, I think, in a way, is, is the easiest uh, textbook case for pretty much everything at the moment in banking system in Europe, and that, that's why we follow it very closely, and that's why we made so much money on it. But if I look at Pasqui, which, by the way, has been around for 700 years, right, if you look at the statement the CEO has been making in the last two or three days, they're clearly saying that after this, there will be, it will be, it could, it, you wouldn't be surprised if it is an M&A takeover target, right? Um, let's not forget that one thing which is true for Pasqui, but it's true for a lot of other banks in Europe, like think about the Kayas in Spain or the Landesbank in, in Germany. A lot of those banks used to be controlled effectively by a very small group of minority shareholders, which had effectively veto power. Now, because of the capital increases, because of the pain in the system, most of these guys have been annihilated. Think again, Monte de Paschi, the banking foundation, has been historical holder of more than 50% of the voting rights in the bank. Now they're down to less than 5%. That is a massive, massive change. So... The big view here is they will play restructuring all the way into EQR stress test, and after that we'll be very aggressively positioned for a big wave of M&A, which I don't think is consensus at all right now. It's building up, uh, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities there. Going on the left side of the of the of, of the of the slide, then is all about ev corporate events. So. Corporate event, uh, clearly the, the DCB is trying to push these people to harm more, to do more, to do any sort of transaction to kind of get uh, some sort of activity going on in the economy, and that's via the banking system. So if you just think that now, effectively, there's probably between 500 and 600 billion of euro available for corporate loans, I don't know, I don't know what else uh, corporate boards need in Europe to kind of get a little bit excited. Now, animal spirits have been frozen probably for the last five, six years, and it's true around the world but it's also true in Europe. So they w this will be a global theme for us. Um, and and I think we'll see a lot more activity on corporate. Now, because of that, I think the value migration is actually the opposite of banks, i.e. you want to be short corporate, uh, selectively, of course, and you want to be uh, uh, finding names where they're going to be aggressively leveraging the balance sheet, which we think is very highly likely. Uh, we, think we may be seeing a lot more LBO, uh, LBO, MBO, we may see corporate re-leveraging anyhow, and I think again we'll see global global M and A picking up quite a bit. We've seen already with AstraZeneca, we've seen it with uh, Alstom, G, Siemens. We'll see a lot more of that. Uh, one big thing that ECB did yesterday, if you want, is to create um, a more um, a more robust environment, a more predictable macro picture for people to be confident and say we can do it. 
uh, and I think we'll see a lot more there. Um, moving away from that, on the macro, as I said, we already spoke about it. We have no crystal ball. Nobody has it. Um, it, it those are the two charts we're putting on. One, uh, that's page, uh, the, the following slide, which is slide seven. We, we put in two pictures just because once on the right side, you see the performance of the 10-year yield over the one-year period over the last 12 months. And then the other one is, the, is the over five years. Now, if you look at over five years, you see an enormous amount of volatility, uh, upside, downside, big moves, right? And if you look at the last one year, it's been a lot more boring, if you want, with effectively a sort of Japanization, which is global. Now, I, I don't know what is the best picture for the future, which is waiting for us. Um, I think if, if the, and I don't know, but I think at the moment the market thinks the picture is picture on, 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 on the right-hand side, so rates will go even lower because there will be even more monetary expansion. Now, if that happens, I think that's very good for developed market, and it can be brutally bad for emerging market. If there is no growth or if there is a limited amount of global growth to be divided up, uh, developed market will try to get it away from emerging market. And I think emerging market has no ability to withstand shocks. Uh, emerging markets look good mainly because of accounting treatment are very different. So, yes, Italy highly levered, and that's very true, and they've got plenty of problems. But at the same time, they already accounted for their pension. They already accounted for their health issue. They already accounted for their social buffers. Most emerging markets just simply don't do it. So if there is a shock, not only don't have those buffers or those transmission channels, but also they will probably need to start accounting for those uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a ad hoc basis. So on that, again, we don't know. We're trying to play. Um, the approach there is, A, super opportunistic, even when the data uh, moves in our direction, we'll have position. B, volatility. We try to have volatility position. Uh, in, on the various themes, so both in terms of emerging market shorts, which we're keeping, and both in terms of like potential rate move, we, we're trying to build the optionality. We've been uh, spending quite a bit of the PL this year. That it doesn't that, that it was above the five percent we already netted. We're already spending it in those sort of optionality, and we keep on doing it as we go along. Um, one, the other, the third approach we, which we're gonna have there is. Um, Effectively, what I would look at, what I defined before, is the implied risk reward by the market. So we're trying to be into a situation where we're trying to be positioned with the best risk reward, which is implied by the market. So either in favor of that or against that, um, and 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 that we will have a global picture. So whether it is um, UK or Japan, but it's always it's always going to be driven by credit analysis, credit fundamentals. We think the only way to deal with macro now is to analyze it as if they were like highly levered credit issuers. So the way to treat a big country like Greece or Cyprus is to treat it as if it were permanent, not as if it were like a, a, an item in a macroeconomic textbook. And the real like bridge to 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 do um, intellectually is to move from a situation where we used to look at mo uh, 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 central banks as pure independent actor in the market, which were just fixing. The, 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 short, the super short-term rate. Now we need to look at those guys as pure commercial banks, actually as the most exposed, levered, under-provisioned banks to their own countries. And that changes the picture completely. We love to think we, we, we live in free markets. We are everything but free markets. Um, the credit markets are the most um, prone and exposed to government intervention. And the government intervention happens through the biggest government agents in the world, which are central banks. Those guys are acting as commercial lenders, and so that's the way, that's the approach, that's the way we view it, and that's the, the sort of uh, intellectual basis we're trying to, to to build on to have our insights and views. So any macro players will only do it based on this approach, and if and when this approach is relevant. If tomorrow balance sheet of central banks were effectively being brought down to zero, um, then we'll probably leave that space because it will not be interesting for us. But as of now, I think we have an edge, and the edge is because we know how to deal with highly levered issuers. And those countries are nothing else than highly levered issuers. The one big challenge, again, for the traditional macroeconomic approach is that whatever is happening at this level is happening globally. So we cannot go on anymore with Japan is the odd event macroeconomic theory is right, it's just Japan that was wrong for the last 10 years. Because now we have, if you want, a Japanification across the world. And so, and, but the, the real issue there is that we are entering into a competitive behavior by central banks. 
let's never forget that Mario Draghi, when he, he in his first conference call, when they were, he was asked to comment on the market data he was monitoring to set the policy, he clearly didn't list in the first question, he didn't list dollar euro. Then he was asked again, How, do you look at dollar euro? And then he said, well, not every time, not every day, sometimes, as in it's totally irrelevant, right? Now, fast forward that to when dollar euro was 140, which is literally a month ago, right? Which is the previous ECB meeting. So just a month ago, and dollar euro was at 140, right? And at that time, it all became about dollar euro, which, which is the big thing we look at in terms of expecting, looking at the future, is going to be an enormous amount of volatility about currency. And there's going to be an enormous amount of volatility around currency because there's going to be an enormous amount of stress around the credit uh, lending policy that central banks have with their own government. And that will be the big, big driver. Uh, but then again, on that, we remain totally opportunistic, ideally through volatility plays, whether it's CDS or outright volatility. And then thirdly, trying to be very, very um, uh, humble and in terms of position, trying to use the minimum amount of value in the book to have like the to play the implied um, uh, implied skew that we see in the market in terms of risk reward. Um, away from that, again, in terms of and, and I've been forced to to come up with this sort of estimates, and that's page eight in terms of the, what we expect, uh, how we expect to make money, not make money. As I said, we're going to have two big drivers, which are events, both in banks and in corporate. On those, we can have anywhere between a negative to positive performance. I think for banks, we can go from minus 2.5 for the next 12 months uh, to plus 20%, and corporates probably minus 3 to plus 15. Well, I'm looking at cash on cash. Those are very difficult estimates to make, but because we've been asked many times, uh, we want to provide them. Um, we will probably deploy up to two-thirds of the capital into those sort of big event strategy, which are like kind of, for us, both bank and corporates will be done across the capital structure. It will be, and, and as always, there has to be a big fundamental driver and a big set of catalysts to have position on the book. So, as I said before, in terms of banks, we'll have all across the capital structure. We spent the last six years in banks. We've been through all their balance sheet. We have a very strong view on different bits and pieces of the liability structure. We may have position which are relative value, position which are capital structure, position which are sector, but most of them, or actually all of them, will have to be into a specific set of catalysts. And, as, and we discussed those, AQR test, test first, and then M&A later. Corporates will probably be a little bit more uh, post-event, reactive um, on specific deals, and or uh, based on sector views, fundamental views, and uh, as again, as we said before, relatively very positive on equity, relatively negative on credit, and that's probably across. And those are the two the two things where we, we attach a quite a bit of uh, predictability, the event strategy, especially after what the ECB did. Not much because uh, if you want the, the, the cash injection, but more because they move past the Rubicon in the market perception. So I think people are a lot more confident having a long-term view or longer-term view in Europe. So from that point of view, those are the two big events we're focusing on. And then we have the third leg, which is the macro credits lever sovereigns. And we already discussed about it. There could be something that can give you a minus 5%, let's say all our position, which uh, uh, technically speaking I would define as relatively bearish one way or another. They all tend to be short through options, so they have a limited expiry, limited life, and if you have them, you need to accept that you may lose all the premium, which those strategies are. So I think there we can lose up to minus 5%. Uh, and then we can make up to 25, of course, we get something right. So the idea really is to produce capital gains through banks and corporates in the event space, and at the same time trying to be uh, as smart as possibly with, with all our limitations in terms of reinvesting some of these this, this gains into what we, we, we view the macro view. Now, the point of macro view is that whether we like it or not, we need to have one, because I think um, with the one of the big, big implications of having a balance sheet expansion of central banks is that you, you don't have the luxury anymore to, to invest without having some understanding of macro and possibly some sort of hedges around the events because those can literally wipe out any sort of like micro events or micro uh, dynamics uh, given the, their size. Um, and with this, I would, I would, uh, the, with this I would close. I would say so the expectation for the next 12 months, I think we can go probably is more likely now, I think, to have a plus 10% for the next 12 months, uh, given the environment. Again, this is a very 
um, as all these expectations said, we have no crystal ball, so I don't pretend to have crystal ball on our profitability. Um, but the, the the way we're building the book, the way we're focusing on is is I was really describing here, and I, I think in the in the sort of base good case, we should be trying to achieve close to 10%. And and I, I wish we could, I hope we can get there. Uh, but at the moment, is is the, the the way we look at the book, those are the three big pillars, and that's where we're focusing, which which is relatively I would say pretty consistent with what we've done so far. Um, so and and we now open and, and uh, to any questions or or, or requests from from investors. Excuse me, this is the Corsco conference operator. We will now begin the question and answer session. Mr. Lanza, there are no questions registered at this time. Fantastic. So hopefully everything was clear. <laughs> but if there's anything else that that, that you guys want to uh, address, either. Uh, on a on a one to one or, or anything, please either go through Stefan or, or Laura at our place. Okay. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye bye.